In past years, I've given the State of the University address at a winter Senate meeting, but the Senate leadership thought that it would invite a broader audience if it were a campus-wide event that is open to everyone, hence today. So, thank you. It was a great idea. The cameras are here to tape our presentations so that we can upload these remarks to the Purdue website and share our discussion with an even wider audience. It's nice to see so many of you here. Thank you for coming. My goal is to bring you up to date on the progress that has been made on the university's strategic plan and to set out the challenges ahead and our responses to them. In brief, Purdue is in good shape to weather the challenges, resilient, forging ahead, and building our reputation, partnerships, and the physical plant. I'll talk more about these bright points for Purdue shortly, but I have to acknowledge that all around us, there are challenges. It would not be news to anyone here that we're in the midst of tough fiscal times. At least 45 states are experiencing budget shortfalls for this year or next year, and at least 28 states have already implemented or proposed cuts to public colleges and universities. Governor Mitch Daniels' recent State of the State Address emphasized that Indiana is in an economic crisis. Not as bad as in some states, but bad enough to threaten some of the most important projects that are in front of us. We won't know, of course, our final state appropriation until the legislative session ends in late April. You know that the state appropriation is set for a two-year period called the biennium, that is for fiscal years 2010 and 2011. There will be one more revenue proje projection before the end of April, and that may have a significant influence on the level of appropriations established for the next two years. In the governor's budget recommendation, which was made in early January, Purdue would see a reduction of approximately 5% of its state operating appropriation, or approximately $16.9 million on a system-wide basis. These numbers include the 1% rescission for this year, which was announced in December. Additionally, a part of the rescission announced in December, $9.9 million, was made to repair and rehabilitation funds. Those are also cuts for the 2008-2009 fiscal year. We've taken several precautionary measures. I want to assure you that they've been taken after a lot of thought and in a directed way that doesn't impede our mission to provide the best quality education. We've made the decision to suspend the special merit pay program, and we've asked your leadership to review position vacancies in travel on a case-by-case -case basis. I would like to ask that everyone do his or her part by measuring expenses against return on investment and look for opportunities to cut costs responsibly. Yet we will continue to pursue the goals that make Purdue distinctive, that position our university to be even greater coming out of this recession. This economic crisis is troubling, but as someone recently said, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. This is an opportunity to regroup, refocus, to think about how to move forward smartly. Now is the time to find new methods to emphasize what we do well and discard or refocus the things that we don't do as well. We need to ensure that we're making the most of our investments and trimming areas with diminished productivity or redundancies wherever we can. And I'd like to ask you to join me in this effort. In the coming months, of course, the senior administration will be looking 
at many inputs, suggestions for cost-saving reductions. We urge the whole campus to be part of this effort. We do have a roadmap for enhancing excellence. It's something that many of you in this room have helped to design. It's, of course, our strategic plan, and it provides us with the signposts to follow through in these tough economic times. The development of the strategic plan tapped the ideas and expertise of our students, of our staff and faculty, and other constituents and stakeholders across Indiana to determine Purdue's direction going forward. Some of you were on a Tiger team. There were eight of them. You did a fantastic job contributing more than 3,000 hours of your valuable time and countless ideas. You discussed the issues, you made creative recommendations, and showed us the best paths to follow. Others offered input on the strategic plan blog or in the many open forums held to discuss strategic areas of focus. The Board of Trustees gave its approval to the strategic plan on June 20th. Three bold themes of our plan serve us today. They are launching tomorrow's leaders, discovery with delivery, and meeting global challenges. With these three areas as our overarching goals, we set key priorities. By identifying and prioritizing these targeted areas, we were able to allocate our resources more effectively. The key priorities we identified are student success, faculty staff development in work life, research competitiveness and economic impact, national global presence, and campus design. As you look at this list, you can see that they follow from our three overarching goals. Under each of these five key priorities, we created specific tasks and device metrics to assess our progress. We used as benchmarks other institutions of high reputational ranking. I'd like to now take you through each area to let you know how we're doing, give you some examples under each of these areas of our progress. The first is student success. More than half our tasks for student success are underway already in the new strategic plan. One priority is to increase recruitment of excellent students. And we are doing so this year with the inauguration last fall of the Presidential and Trustees Scholarships for students of the highest merit. This has made us more competitive for the best students and already shows in our academic profile. We will continue to raise our admission standards through several, several strategies, requiring more rigorous coursework in students' high school preparation, requiring, as we've done for this uh, incoming class next fall, essays on admissions applications and increasing the academic profile of admittees, enhancing retention measures, and keeping our integrated recruitment measures congruent with the Purdue student experience. Messages of high expectations, exciting opportunities, strong student support, and the value of a Purdue degree. We realize that our focus should not be on how many students we enroll right after high school, but rather how many we successfully retain and graduate. Student success stems from both the quality of our entering student's credential and our capacity and commitment to support and teach them well during their first years with us. Purdue West Lafayette is a challenging academic environment, and admitting students who are underprepared is not in their best interest or in the best interest of the entire campus. We're working closely with Ivy Tech, Vincennes, our regional campuses, 
and the Indiana Commission for Higher Education to enhance transfer pathways for students who need additional preparation after high school. Increasing our transfer numbers will take us out of remedial education and enable us to continue to achieve overall enrollment goals, balance our course offerings more selectively and effectively, and maintain accessibility for students when they're prepared so that they're prepared to be successful and especially focusing on our Indiana residents. Purdue faculty and administrators must partner with other state institutions to ensure appropriate rigor and transferability of courses that will enable transfers to progress seamlessly toward earning a West Lafayette degree. We're committed to doing that. We still have a long ways to go, but that is our goalpost. Purdue's also moving towards the requirement of four years of high school math. If there's a quick barometer of success, this is it. Studies show that students who take math throughout high school are more likely to succeed in college, no matter what their major. We're expecting more from entering students, and research shows that the more you expect, the more you get. A recent report by the National College Board showed that Indiana lags most other states in both high school graduation rate and college degrees. The Indiana Commission for Higher Education is mindful of this and has set targets to be achieved through its own white paper, its strategic plan. Purdue will work with the Commission towards achieving the common goals, but we expect our state funding to be favorable in order to succeed in this. Another priority for student success is to develop a plan to ensure increased diversity of the student body. To do so requires a focused campus-wide strategy in which all academic and student service areas are united in goals and coordinated in approach. Thus, we've created the position of Vice Provost for Diversity to take on this vital task. This person would act as Chief Diversity Officer for the university. Our national search for the best candidate is in progress. In the interim, Dr. Carolyn Johnson holds the position and is doing a great job for us. Thank you, Carolyn. Diversity is equally important in the faculty. Here we are changing the face of Purdue. For this 2008-2009 academic year, 108 new faculty members have joined Purdue. Of these hires, 71, or 66 percent, of of them are women and or minorities, and this is a trend we'd like to see continue. Another key area for student success includes developing a university-wide core curriculum. I'm gratified to see that the leadership of the University Senate is very much engaged in this. It has taken on this proposal. Dozens of faculty members have volunteered to join this effort to look anew at the alignment of our curriculum with learning goals in a new age. Our strategic plan would also foster success in gateway courses in science, engineering, and math through new pedagogy. These are under development by the colleges with a lot of significant pilot programs, spectacular examples. I'm very pleased to see the creative approaches to enhancing the success of our students in these courses. Here we can truly develop national role models for changing the face of freshman, sophomore year education in these fields and retain many more students in what's called the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. Funding for increased financial aid and scholarships became an important element of our student success initiatives. And that's why we developed Access and Success, which is a $304 million campaign that will expand student financial aid and programs directed to student success at Purdue. To date, we've achieved nearly 30% of our multi-year goal. In addition to goals for various academic success programs, like the Common Reading Initiative, 
The focus of the campaign is student scholarships. There are opportunities that can match the interests and passions of all alumni and friends at Purdue. First, for those who want to help us attract the very best and brightest to Purdue, the program that I mentioned are high merit presidential and trustee scholarships. Next, to ensure that Purdue remains accessible to the lowest income Indiana residents, the Purdue Promise combines grant and work aid with academic and social support for 21st century scholars, beginning with the fall 2009 class. And third, of special interest to many donors and the Purdue community, the Marquis Scholarship is targeted for middle-income Indiana residents who qualify for little or no federal or state aid. In the coming weeks, we will be announcing the qualifications and eligibility for the Marquis Scholarship for fr freshmen entering next fall. And finally, in addition to these programs, we also welcome new and enhanced scholarships that support other enrollment goals, such as supporting students from particular geographic areas and school districts. Diversity-oriented scholarships that can be awarded through our holistic scholarship selection process are also encouraged. And the colleges have many more uh, specialty scholarship programs that they are offering. In all of our marketing and financing messages to both prospective and continuing Purdue students, we continue to emphasize the value of a Purdue degree. Employers continue to recruit our students for both internships and permanent employment. Our graduates who carry student loans have one of the lowest default rates in the nation, less than 1%. Over 90% of our recent graduates are employed or are in graduate school within six months of graduation. And in the past month, two external sources, Smart Money Magazine and the Princeton Review, have cited Purdue as a best value with a high return on investment. We beat schools like Harvard and Yale. We also just learned that Purdue beat a number of Ivy League colleges in another area, which is web popularity worldwide. The goal of this ranking is to provide an approximate popularity ranking of worldwide universities and colleges based on how, uh, how much their websites are used. And Purdue was number six in the world in this ranking. Of course, the real value of Purdue is created by our faculty and our staff. It's their vital roles that shape the Purdue experience. Our faculty, as you know, includes some of the world's outstanding scholars and researchers. Last year, for example, Ju Chen, Associate Professor in Biological Sciences, became the first a Purdue University scientist to be appointed as an investigator for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, Fellowships. This is an incredibly prestigious award. Twelve previous Hughes investigators have been honored with the Nobel Prize. Philip Nelson, a professor in food science, was awarded agriculture's Nobel Prize equivalent, the World Food Prize. Dr. Nelson was honored for his work in aseptic processing. It's a technology that allows processing of large quantities of seasonal crops, like tomatoes and oranges, for long-term storage and bulk transportation. Yesterday, it was announced that Dr. Les Geddes was the first recipient of Indiana's Dr. Philip E. Nelson Innovation Award, which is created by Governor Mitch Daniels to recognize outstanding Hoosier scientists. So we're doubly proud today, proud at the honor that's being bestowed on Dr. Geddes, and proud that the award is named by the governor for one of our most esteemed faculty members. This past fall, nine of our faculty members won the National Science Foundation's most coveted honor for outstanding young researchers, the Faculty Early Career Development Award. And some of you know English professor Robert Lamb. He's taught here for 28 years and never missed a class. The Carnegie Foundation named Dr. Lamb the Indiana Professor of the Year. 
part of my job is to ensure that Purdue is led and managed by top administrators across the state. My first appointment as your new president was bringing hope to the campus. Danny Hope, that is, your new football coach. Danny Hope is hard at work at this very moment, finding the best recruits for the team. We're proud of our fine athletics program as it inspires the students to do their best and it engages our alumni. Thank you to Morgan Burke for his leadership and good luck to all our coaches. I've been recruiting some of the best academic and business leaders for our university to complement the other terrific academic and business leaders that we have here. I'd like you to meet our new recruits in order of their taking office. And please hold your applause until they've all been recognized. Uh, Provost Randy Woodson, Randy, would you stand up? And uh, Vice President for Research, Richard Bacayas. Vice President for Marketing and Media, Terry Thompson. Vice President for Physical Facilities, Bob McMains. Chief of Staff to the President, Carolyn Curiel. Interim Executive Vice President for Business and Finance and Treasurer, Jim Almond. Vice President for Ethics and Compliance, Elisa Christmas Rollock. Associate Vice President for Governmental Relations, Tim Sanders. And we have three newly appointed deans. Dean of Purdue Agriculture, Jay Ackridge, and I know he's on the road because I was just with him in Indianapolis earlier today. Dean of the Graduate School, Mark Smith. And Dean for the College of Education, Marianne Santos de Barona, who will be joining us this summer. I'd also like to mention that Rob Mukherjee is now Executive Director of Strategic Planning and Assessment, overseeing the strategic planning more broadly across the university. I'd like you to help me show our appreciation to all of these talented, dedicated people and thank them for coming to Purdue and staying at Purdue. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank all of you who participated in the search process for these positions. Many of the deans, many of the faculty led these very important searches. In some cases, as you see, we found the people to fill these roles on the campus, and in others, we recruited from the outside. It was a long process, and all of you involved gave it your valuable time and serious thought, and I thank you very much for that. A second key priority area within our strategic plan is faculty and staff development and work life. Within that area, we tasked ourselves to enhance compensation and benefits. For fiscal year 2009, which began, of course, this past fall, we were able to have the highest salary raises since fiscal year 2000, nearly 4% overall. In less than three months from the board's approval of our strategic plan, the trustees adopted a paid parental leave policy. The policy was first brought forward in the University Senate and then became a partnership between the faculty and the staff and the administration. This past fall, we saw the opening of the Patty Jiski Early Care and Education Center. Providing choices like these help our faculty and staff to balance the demands of work, life, and family life. And addressing quality of work life issues is an essential part of improving the Purdue experience for our faculty and staff. We have a long way to go. We have a lot of current fiscal challenges, but our strategic plan has given us direction. Another priority area within our strategic plan is research competitiveness and economic impact. Here too, we are making progress and I'll highlight a few recent accomplishments. In the past six months, Purdue has opened two new technology parks, one in New Albany, which is in southeastern Indiana, and one that we just dedicated in Indianapolis near the airport last week. These are in addition to the ones that we already have in Merrillville and, of course, our Purdue Research Park and Discovery Park right here in West Lafayette. 
All of these are incubators for innovation and will help Purdue become one of the top research delivery universities in the world. And I'd like to personally thank Joe Hornet for his leadership with the new technology parks in particular. Thank you, Joe. Remember our goal, discovery with delivery. The facilities at Discovery Park are designed for interdisciplinary research and provide a unique interdisciplinary infrastructure among science, engineering, technology, education, and other disciplines with a focus on global challenges. Many of our faculty members are making important discoveries that someday may help citizens of the world and are indeed already doing so. Last week alone, there were public announcements of many stunning Purdue accomplishments in research, and I'd like to just give three examples. One was featured in today's exponent. Out of Graham Cook's chemistry lab is a test for melamine, a toxic found in Chinese food products. Another out of ECE, Professor Babak Ziai's team, comprising mostly students, heralds the record for how long one can stretch an electrical conductor. These liquid electrodes developed in the Burke Nanotechnology Lab are being used to study stresses on cardiac cells. And a third announcement from a team led by Tim Fisher in mechanical engineering concerns a new biosensor made of gold-coated nanocubes tethered to carbon nanotubes. The sensors could, in principle, be used to continuously monitor blood glucose for diabetics. Our distinguished faculty continues to inspire us as they connect basic research to extraordinary applications. I was proud to be one of those who represented Purdue University at the inauguration of President Barack Obama. His pledge to, quote, restore science to its rightful place and wield technology's wonders to raise healthcare's quality lower its cost, among many other things, was an encouraging message for great research universities like ours. Successful research helps us gain wide attention. This is the next key priority on our list of five, national and global presence. Increased visibility for Purdue for what it does very well is key to securing a broader investment in our research and scholarship. We will shortly advertise and search internally for a vice provost for global affairs. To accomplish its 21st century land grant mission, Purdue must serve as a hub for innovation and global cooperation, linking Purdue faculty, staff, and students to a global network of strategic partners. This means that Purdue will have the leading portfolio of innovative global learning opportunities, embrace research that has global impact, and link with local and global partners to address the grand challenges of our time. We'll encourage initiatives that improve human well-being and extend worldwide the benefits of science and technology. We've asked Carolyn Curiel to coordinate the launching of our new Public Policy Institute, which would combine Purdue's strengths in the physical and life sciences and engineering with a public policy platform. This would enhance the impact of Purdue nationally and globally. In a new presidential administration, this is definitely the time for Purdue to be a leader in national affairs. We have the talent among our faculty and the research staff to do so. We now need to identify those areas where Purdue is poised to make an impact and construct a plan to position our university to realize this impact more broadly. Our final key priority under the strategic plan is campus design. I'm sure you've noticed all the construction going on. We've completed the multi-year food services consolidation plan within the new university residence system with the opening of Wiley Dining Court. My husband Chris and I can personally attest to the quality of the food there and the enjoyment of getting to eat with the students. 
The newest residence hall facility will be completed for fall 2009 occupancy. For now, we've given it a generic name, First Street Towers, but we're looking for someone who wants to adopt it and put his or her name on it. I'd like to thank at this moment John Souter for his leadership in the housing and dining services area and his whole team. Other major projects under construction, Discovery Learning Center, Hockmeyer Hall of Structural Biology, those are both on schedule. The Mackey Complex is coming. I'm very excited that the initial site work is underway for Mackey. It's going to be just stunning when it's finished. One of our key priorities for campus design was to incorporate sustainability as well as energy, environmental, and ecological consciousness onto our campus. By making this a component of the strategic plan, we are able to ensure that this element will be frequently emphasized and incorporated into everything we do. For example, the Roger Gatewood addition to mechanical engineering is our first leadership in energy and environmental design, or LEED, green building project. Through this project, we're learning firsthand about the benefits of green buildings, and we plan to incorporate the principles that we've been learning into future projects. A number of other buildings are already un under review for potential LEED certification, and we hope to get to the point when all our buildings are LEED certified. It's important for us to examine how we use energy on the campus by exploring green building techniques. And it's, at the same time, it's critical that we evaluate the impacts of how we generate that energy. The Boiler 6 project replaces outdated steam generation with new technology to serve the university's highly efficient combined heat and power system. Not only will this upgrade increase the plant's overall efficiency and reliability, it will decrease the plant's total emissions of regulated pollutants by 40 to 90 percent annually and make use of biomass at our plant feasible in all of our solid fuel boilers. Now, just in case you don't think this is real exciting, I have to mention that I am teaching our president's leadership class this year is devoted to sustainability, and I had all the students over on Monday night. We were talking about sustainability on the campus, and they've asked for a tour of our power plant. And I thought, when, when the curriculum suggests to the students that they should go uh, on their own into uh, having a tour of the power plant and really understand at a fundamental level what we're doing there with reducing emissions and how uh, heat and cooling works on our campus, then we've uh, really achieved something to incorporate the students in, uh, in our physical plant um, efforts and our sustainability initiatives. Other green efforts have included recycling at the football games this fall, and that was a big undertaking undertaking and I want to thank everyone for the cooperative efforts for the members of physical facilities, athletics, and the Boiler Green Student Club in that. To assist in forward sustainability at Purdue, physical facilities formalized recently the Director of Sustainability and Environmental Stewardship position with Dr. Robin Mills Ridgway serving in this capacity and I thank Robin for taking on this responsibility and Bob McMains for appointing her. Too numerous to list today are the other programs across the campus that collectively demonstrate the university's commitment to sustainability. Many of these programs were highlighted during our first Green Week last September. I look forward to reaching the point at which Purdue is green all year round. We've completed the planning and conceptual design for the Recreational Sports Center, and I hope you saw the headline article in today's exponent about the Rec Sports Center. We're waiting for approval in this legislative session before we can proceed further. The entire development process for the new Rec Center has been a real team effort, and it was led by students with faculty and administration support. It's a great example of how our key priorities overlap. The Rec Center meets our goals for campus design, quality of life, and student success. When it's completed, the center will improve the health and the quality of life of our students and make us more competitive with our peer institutions and offer 
um, alternative venues for student uh, enjoyment, let's say, at uh, uh, weekends and evenings, as well as, of course, recreational activities. Another key priority that was identified in our strategic plan was to implement a new campus master plan for West Lafayette and each of our three regional campuses. We've completed these plans and they've all been reviewed, uh, all the regional ones have been reviewed by the Board of Trustees and approved. The new West Lafayette Campus Master Plan will be presented to the Board at its meeting next week. Our strategic plan is only seven months old, yet, as you can see, we're making significant progress. There's, of course, a lot to do. This chart shows a comparison of Purdue's financial resources per student, actually per full-time equivalent FTE student. It compares it to our peer and our Big Ten public institutions in uh, revenue areas. Purdue is on the left, peer institutions are in the center, and Big Ten publics are on the right. These data represent the uh, fiscal year 2007. It's the nature of this kind of information, as you know, to lag a bit, but I felt that looking at our situation relative to other universities would be helpful, and we'll have the fiscal year 2008 results by this summer. There are five channels of revenue stream displayed here. Starting at the bottom and moving up, uh, state appropriation. Tuition, sponsored programs, private gifts and donations, and then finally auxiliary funds. They're represented by the different colors in the bars that you see in the chart. So in state appropriation, the bottom level, you can see that Purdue falls behind our peer and Big Ten public institutions by about 20%. This is made up for somewhat in tuition, which is the next level up. Not because we have high tuition fees. In fact, it's just the opposite. Our tuition rates are considerably lower for in-state students than our comparison colleges. The reason we are able to run in parity with tuition funding is because of the large number of non-resident students who come to our West Lafayette campus and pay the full ticket price. Moving up the bars, we come to sponsored programs, which largely signifies externally funded research. The difference you can see here is dramatic. Purdue is behind our peer and Big Ten public institutions in sponsored program funding. Similarly, the next level, private funding, lags substantially behind. It's important to remember, however, that this chart shows a frozen moment at, in time, at the end of a particular time period. What it doesn't show is the uh, derivative, the trend. It doesn't show that we have doubled philanthropy and we have doubled sponsored research funding over the past seven years. So the trend is excellent. The top level represents auxiliary funds. These are self-supporting areas such as athletics and the residence hall system, and this fund, funding is fairly even uh, in our comparison. Overall then, what this chart shows us is that Purdue is about 37% behind our peers and Big Ten publics. It gives us a clear picture of where we need to focus our efforts in growing our resources. We will continue to seek funding from all sources to further advance our strategic plan, our goals. To do the, this, we realize that partnerships are critical. There are about 4,000 institutions of higher learning in the United States, and only 60, just 60, qualify to be included in the AAU as research universities. The Association of American Universities, and Purdue is one, and IU is another. So how smart we would be if we combined the strengths, the very distinctive and somewhat different strengths of each of our two great research 
institutions in the state for the benefit of both and ultimately for the benefit of the state of Indiana and the world. So that's the idea behind the Indiana Innovation Alliance, or IIA as we call it. It's our proposed partnership with IU in the life and biosciences. The alliance would unite Purdue and IU with businesses, economic development organizations, healthcare enterprises, and the state government to expand Indiana's share of national investments in bioscience research and development. The IIA is designed around three key strategies. The first is to make Indiana a hotspot for life sciences and biosciences research by enhancing its core research capabilities. This is really an infrastructure component. These capabilities will be available to both academic and corporate researchers throughout the state. When we remove duplication of burdensome costs of equipment, salaries and infrastructure, research expenses decrease and everyone benefits. These facilities would be prime facilities that can't be paid through normal grant funding. The second strategy for the IIA is to bring more national funding to Indiana. States that provide matching funds for large-scale research grants and initiatives have a much greater potential for winning major national funding. And this feeds the sponsored program channel through which we can bring funding to Purdue. So it's absolutely necessary that we position ourselves for increased federal funding by increasing our ability to match. We anticipate that the IIA would increase also much needed medical and pharmaceutical professionals in Indiana. Finally, we would try to make health care more affordable and accessible for everyone. The Alliance would support programs that communities need to improve the health of our citizens and lower employer health care costs through cooperative extension programs. So for all of these reasons, for Purdue and for all of the potential benefit to Indiana citizens and citizens worldwide, we're going to continue to seek state support for the Indiana Innovation Alliance. It's still early in the state budget approval process. The, uh, lots of our supporters statewide from corporations to legislators really support this initiative. We're not giving up on new state appropriations to support it. We've made presentations to the state legislature's um, uh, budget committee and also the Indianapolis Chamber of Commerce, community councils, and small business groups to gain support for the initiative. And next week, we testify before the State Ways and Means Committee. And when I testify to the state, I'm uh, always doing so in partnership with President Michael McRobbie at IU because we want to show that we're going together uh, to, for uh, in support of this initiative. We remind our legislators that the alliance is one important way that Purdue can help economic development in our state. Purdue itself is Indiana's sixth largest employer and it's amazing how many people don't know that. In fact, I was with a prominent uh, group this morning where that was a surprise to them that we are the sixth largest employer in Indiana. We provide jobs to more than 18,000 people statewide, and we generate employment for an additional 10,000 people who provide goods and services. In a time when few returns are guaranteed, an investment in Purdue is one that the state can count on. Every dollar entrusted to Purdue is managed with care. Our university has one of the best records of fiscal management of any large university that helps us weather tough economic times like these and get maximum return for our investors' dollars. So here's the ratio that we should all remember, and this comes out of a recent assessment of economic impact of Purdue. For every dollar the state invests in Purdue, we generate nearly nine dollars in total impact to the economy through salaries, consumer spending, and much more. A nine to one return on investment. I would say that that's a very good return on investment. So when we talk about what Purdue University needs, I'd like us all to remind people that Purdue gives back and in the 
huge way, economically and through important research, and of course through educating 72,000 students system-wide. All of us have the opportunity to be ambassadors for Purdue. We do so when we volunteer with nonprofit groups, when we serve on commissions and boards, and guide the direction of many community and civic organizations that shape our cities and our counties and our state. To be effective ambassadors, we need to carry a unified message as we advocate for Purdue. We all, as I'd like to say, need to be on the same page. So, let me take a moment to describe to you what being on the same page means. It means that we all agree on certain messages about Purdue and where it's going. So first, fiscal reality. Purdue is managed prudently and will continue to be a model of a fiscally effective university. While any salary raises will be difficult in this environment, we need to retain flexibility to address market and retention issues. Second, academic preparedness. Student success depends on this. At Purdue, we're committed to raising the academic preparedness of the state by raising our own academic standards. It includes also recognizing our role in enhancing K-12 education through teacher training, outreach programs, and summer bridge programs. Third, the student experience. We're committed to improving the student experience through enhancing the quality of life on campus, through curricular reform, and by providing enhanced opportunities for service, research, and global experiences. Fourth, affordability. We're proud that Purdue was recently named by a nationally recognized publication as one of the top 10 universities in the nation for value. We're respectful of the choices that the state needs to make to ensure a balanced budget and we appreciate the financial difficulties that college students and their families face. My administration is continually looking at best financing approaches in order to assure that Purdue can continue to provide a quality education. Fifth, external funding. We'll intensify our efforts to increase other important sources of revenue, such as sponsored research and philanthropy. Because of our recent doubling in these areas and the huge success of our recent capital campaign, I'm optimistic that we'll continue to increase external funding. But success does require new, innovative approaches. And finally, priorities. The key priorities that I've talked about today, priorities that embrace diversity, sustainability, and the need to recruit and retain top talent and reward it are found within our strategic plan. I've shown that in all areas we're making progress and now now's the time to accelerate those efforts. I welcome your partnership as we move forward on the same page. Thank you.